6, and we're going to continue our study of the book of Hosea today. We've, uh, we've been off from it for a couple weeks. The Lord changed my sermon, you know, a couple weeks ago, and I preached something other than what I prepared, and, uh, and we had folks saved. And then last week, y'all surprised me, and I still thank you for that. And Brother Ronald did a that folks say. So, uh, it's good. And God's good. Amen? Hosea chapter 6. We're going to read all 11 verses. Uh, we're not going to cover all 11 verses today, but I want to read them in the context of what we're talking about. So, Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. It says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn and He will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, and his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Therefore have I hewed I hewed them by the prophets, and I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Take attention to that verse. For I have desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is the city of them that work iniquity and polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is order of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, he has set a harvest for you when I return to the captivity of my people. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. God, for what you've already done, Lord, those souls that have and, and, and have walked through the waters of baptism this morning and, and Lord have identified with you. We praise you for that. And Lord, today, Lord, just the psalm service that has been so uplifting. And Lord, praise to your holy name. And God, right now, as we come to your word, Lord, we pray that you would just help us to just cast out the things of the world, just to concentrate solely on you. Lord, allow you to talk to us for just a few moments from your word and do a work in our lives. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we uh, continue this study of the book of Hosea, I've got to kind of go back and remind you for just a minute, because it has been, this has been three weeks since we've been in it. Uh, we saw in, in chapter 5, we saw the most dreadful consequence of the sin of Israel. Now here's something that, that people need to understand. That sin always carries consequences. I don't care if you're saved or you're lost or whatever. Lost, it'll send you to a place called hell to spend eternity there if you don't repent and turn to Jesus. Christ and come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Listen, sin will send you to hell. The Bible says the soul that sinned, it shall die. And that means there, friends, that people will spend eternity in a place called hell. But friends, also we need to understand as believers that sin carries consequences. And so Israel had experienced the consequences of their sin. They had experienced the most dreadful consequences. God had said, I am going to remove my presence from this people. Now, I want to take just a moment to speak to that because we kind of ended there a few weeks ago. I feel like I need to, to, to just speak through to this and I'll move on. But there's many of us here that if we're honest, we can relate to that. We can relate to uh, feeling apart from God. We can relate to experiencing a time in our life where we do not feel near Him. His presence is not uh, near us. And uh, we, we, we maybe we said, God, where are you? I mean, have you ever felt like that? You just say, Amen. I mean, I've been there. I've been there and thought, God, where are you? And this is, I remember one of the, the, the most uh, troublesome times for me. Uh, it, it really made me focus inwardly, but uh, when we had our son, and I, I've told this story before, when we had our son in May 2010, I, I'm going to tell you, the doctor came in and told me, he said, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what's going on. Well, this is bleeding. We're not sure. Uh, you know, we're giving her blood. I mean, it, it's not critical yet, but it could be. And, and I mean, I just hit my knees. And first of all, I said, God, what have I done? You know? God, what have I done to be going through this? But, but in the midst of that, I'm also saying, God, where are you? God, you've got to show up. You've got to do something. So I can relate to the fact that there's times when we feel apart from God. And you know, you cry out and say, where are you? And, and hear me on this, though. I believe with all my heart that when we experience those times in our lives where we don't feel close to God, that it is always the result of some victory that the enemy has won in your life. 
You say, Brother Jeff, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. If you feel apart from God, though you're in a right relationship with God, though you're living for God, though you're doing the things that God would have you to do, and you feel apart from God, the enemy is trying to deceive you. And deception is his game. The Bible says that he is the father of all lies. He is a liar. And so if you are walking in a right relationship with God and you still feel apart from God, listen, the enemy is trying to deceive you. Some people say, well, Brother Jeff, I know I've been living right, but I'm right in the midst of a storm. And so what, what, what do you think's wrong with me? Listen, quit looking at the storm and get your eyes on the Savior because the devil is using the storm to take, to take opportunity to convince you that God doesn't care, but God does care. Man. See, people want God to deliver them out of the storm or from the storm. Even. They don't even want to go through the storm. But can I just tell you that sometimes God allows you to get in the midst of the storm because it's in the midst of the storm where we learn who God really is and what He can really do in our lives when we trust Him with all our heart. Amen. See, the storms of life sometimes, friends, they shape us. They shape us. But the other reason I say and if you feel apart from God, that it might be a victory that the enemies won, is listen, you just look at what's going on in Hosea's day. It, it, it did not matter that God had delivered their ancestors. It did not matter the blessings that had been poured out on them. Uh, they were a blessed people. They are highly favored. They are God's chosen people, God's special treasure. He had chosen these people. And yet they turned on Him and they did what they wanted to do. They did not follow in the way uh, that God had commanded them to do. And, and the devil had managed to drag them off into sin and into spiritual adultery. And so they're out there. They're out of the will of God. They're worshiping these false gods that can do nothing for them. And you know what, folks? They're sitting there going, what's wrong with us? God, where are you in the midst of this? And it appears when we get to chapter 6 that they realize, oh, we've got to go back to God. Oh my goodness, you know, a nation turning back to God. How much do we need that today? In our country, we need a nation to wake up and to return to God. Amen. So you know what? Oh, you let something happen. You let something happen and everybody's ready to go flood the church house. 9-11, yeah. I mean, I know we're, we're 13 years removed from that. But listen, 9-11 people flocked to the church house and it was short-lived. Yeah. A few years later, Hurricane Katrina happened. People flocked to the church houses. But listen, it was short-lived. And over and over, God allows things to come into our country. And just as He did with the nation of Israel, allow them to go to their own devices, turn them over to their own wickedness and their own hearts and their own desires. And listen, they wonder why in the world God is not blessing them the way He was blessing them. Man. They're out of His will. And so if we feel apart from God, if we've chosen to remove ourselves from His will, we shouldn't be surprised when we don't feel near Him. We choose to give place to the enemy in our life and to let him get a little victory. It requires us to return. God's not left. God's where he was. He's right where we left him. We have to go back to him. See, what did he say in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15? He said, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. He said, they're going to have to admit they're wrong. That's repentance, folks. Anybody who gets saved has to come to a place where they acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they have done wrong, that they are the ones who have been wrong, that God is right, and that God has the way and the plan for salvation is His Son, Jesus Christ. And listen, He says, you have to come to Me. Come to Me. But why? Because He's already came to us. He uh, wrapped Himself in flesh and came, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross of Calvary. He's already come to us. We've got to come to Him. Amen. Amen. God is calling people to return. And as you move into this sixth chapter, you, you think, as you read about those first three verses there, you think, well, they figured it out. They figured out they've got to go back to God. And so we read in verse 2 here, uh, they point to a day of coming revival and their return to God. Verse 2 says, after two days will He revive us, and the third day He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. See, if we just start doing what God wants is what they think. He'll take care of the mess we're in. Isn't that our attitude a lot of times? Uh, you say, Brother Jeff, what do you mean? Well, I mean, just they felt like just by returning to the worship of God, they've tried Baal, they've tried these other idols, and it ain't doing that for them. And matter of fact, the blessings have been removed from their land, and so they think, well, we'll just go to God, and God will fix everything, right? And that's how we do sometimes. You let things start going bad in our lives, things not going well, and you, you don't tell me, and you can look at me 
y'all holy if you want to. But you don't tell me that when things start going wrong that you don't tend to pray a little bit more. Hello? Man. I mean, you start praying. You, you might, you know, uh, when things are going well, you might offer a McDonald's drive through prayer. Hey, God, it's me again. Thank you for this. And I just need this, 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 and this. And life will be great. Amen. And go about your life. But you let something go wrong in your life. And friends, you want to ring the rafters of heaven trying to get a hold to God to get Him to do something about the situation that you find yourself in. Man. I'm that way too, hello? You know what, maybe even uh, when, when we feel apart from God or when things aren't going well, maybe we try to get in the Bible a little bit more. Well, I probably, just, I probably haven't been reading the Bible as much as I should, so I'll start reading the Bible and you just pick somewhere and you start reading and you start searching and God does start speaking to you. But listen, friends, it, it's not just about doing a little bit more, just putting a little bit more effort out. It's about being genuine in what you're doing. Man. I mean, people come into church. I, I find people going through struggles. You know what? We tend to try to put out a little bit more effort because we need God. And so we come in and, and we say, well, God, I'm going to sing a little bit more. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, give my heart a little bit more. And I'm going to be a little bit more involved in things because I need you. I need you to affect my situation. And so I feel like if I do this, then God will be inclined to come to me. Friends, but what we need, we don't need some superficial act of coming back to God. What we need is real revival. And real revival begins with us and ends with God. Man. Do you hear me? It begins, real revival begins with my people who are called by my name. Right? What do they got to do? They've got to seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I heal, hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Man. It starts with us. It starts with me. It starts with the church. And then it goes toward God. And God is inclined. When His people experience real, true repentance and revival, God is inclined to answer. See, we need to recognize that areas of our life where we may not be in the will of God, we may not be doing what He's called us to do. We, we need to have a God encounter. And it needs to be such that it changes us, that we go out there. That we go out here, revive, refresh, restore, however you want to put that. Seek God's promise that in His Word. He promised seasons of refreshing to those who turn to Him. As a matter of fact, He said this in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. He said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Do you see that? The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. But did you see how it started? It says, repent you therefore. Repent you therefore. When I hear, and be converted, when I hear those words, you know what it shouts to me? Genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. See, that's what God is looking for. But what He saw in Israel, what we find out, and what He sees in us sometimes, is there a problem with the repentance of these people. While they profess from their lips their desire to return to God, God knows their heart. Do you believe that this morning? Amen? But it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, God's Word says it, okay? You know, I had somebody say one time, so God said it and I believe it. Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, God said it and it makes it true, okay? You just have to deal with it. That's what the Bible says. See, the Bible says that God sees the heart of the matter. See, they express this desire to return to God and repent. And we're going to go back to Him. He'll heal us. He'll revive us. He'll bind us up. He'll do all these things for us if we just turn back to Him. But we find the heart of the matter in Hosea chapter 6, verse 4, that God has seen their heart. And God says, at the end of verse 4, it says, For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. God says their repentance is short-lived. Now, what do you mean by that, Brother Jeff? I mean when things get going wrong. We'll just come to God. And we'll come down here and we'll and you'll see altars full in churches and you'll see people, uh, oh God, this is the situation and God, I need you to intervene and God, I need you to do this. And listen, they get up from the altar and they feel better. They should because they come to God. But listen, because they weren't intent on being different. While they were just asking God to affect the situation, they weren't asking God to change me, God to change my heart, God to hold me and make me. Guess what? It's short. It lasts like this. But when the heart changes, when, when we allow God to have His perfect work in our heart, then we, we take on His heart's desire. We take on uh, the things that He wants us to do. And so it becomes a relationship. And it becomes something that is not short-lived. It becomes a lifetime commitment. It becomes a lifestyle. 
See, there's no depth to their repentance. See, it's the same thing that happens. People find themselves suffering under the consequence of sin and they go to God and they mourn their suffering and how they need God to come and rescue you. But would to God that we would understand that we need to come down before God grieving over our sin and the fact that it was not the act of God to bring the suffering upon us, but it was our own willfulness to turn from Him. Man. Some of the very things that are going on in people's lives right now is the consequence of their own doing. They've made choices and they're bearing the consequence of their sin. The Bible teaches that, that every man's sin will be upon his own head. In other words, your mom and your daddy ain't going to do something that's going to bring uh, consequences to your life. You say, oh, now wait a minute, Brother Jeff, I'm affected by things that people have done. Hey, you, you, may, you may see the fallout, but you're not going to bear the punishment for what your family chooses. Man. But you yourself will bear the consequence of your own sins, what the Bible teaches. See, we need to understand our need to come before Him and to say, you know what, God? God, it's me. God, I'm the one. I'm the one that needs to turn around. See, the Israelites were tired of all the things that were happening to them as a result of their sin. They were frustrated. But they were not yet to the place where they were saying, God, it's us. We're the ones that have turned from you. We're the ones that are in the wrong. And God could see that they had not reached the place of godly sorrow. You know what the Bible says about godly sorrow? Godly sorrow works repentance that need not be repented of. But the sorrow of the world does what? Works death, right? Huh? The, the godly sorrow works repentance. Godly sorrow produces in us true repentance. God can see what we cannot see. The Bible teaches in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. It says, if you look on down here, uh, For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found with thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. God knows whether you're real or not. God knows whether you're real. Why are you telling us that? Because, listen, I, I have been in a position... <laughs> In my life. For 12 years of my life, I was a lost church member. And some of you think, that's crazy. A lot of y'all know this about me because you've been going to church here long enough to know this about me. But for 12 years of my life, I walked around because of some prayer I prayed. I joined the church. I did everything the church had told me to do that I was going to go to heaven. And at 17 years old, sitting in a revival, God began to deal my heart that I wasn't real. That what I had wouldn't take me to heaven. That what I had could not get me through the gate. And listen, that night in a revival in, in May of 2003, as I sat there under the preaching of God's Word, God got a hold of me and let me know that it was me that He was after and that I needed to come to Him and I needed to truly repent. I needed to truly turn my life over to Him. Now let me tell you, I, I've been here eight years, but listen, I've been in that church all my life. 17 years of my life I grew up in that same church. Do you think when I walked down the aisle that night in May 2003 that most people were expecting me to take the microphone and to say, listen, tonight I got saved? No. Matter of fact, there's people went, what? What do you mean? You know why? Because, listen, I could talk the talk. I could walk the walk. I could do all the things that we should do in church. And we should be nice to people. We should love people. We should help people come into Christ. And we should try to reach out to other people out in the community. And I was involved in every activity. I'd be the first person to go knocking on doors when the preacher wanted to go reach out to people. But, listen, I was lost. Because I wasn't real. It wasn't real. And I had to get something that was real. And so that night in May 2003, God saved me. Listen, we may fool people and you may put on a charade in the church, but you cannot fool God. God is not taken in with our outward religion when there is no depth of the relationship in our heart. Look at what he said in Hosea 6, 6. I mean, I want you to understand this. I want you to grasp what this, this six chapter is about. It says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now here it is in a nutshell. All wrapped up for you this morning. God pointedly tells them, look, this is the fruit. This is what will prove whether or not you're serious about coming back to me. This will prove whether you're going to quit messing around with that idol worship. 
is when you just when you decide that you're going to start walking in obedience to me. You know what? Because at this point, at this point in the book of Hosea, the Israelites don't even know the heart of God. And friends, until you get in touch with the heart of God, you can't begin to do God's will for your life. You can't begin to be obedient to Him. You have to know God in a relationship so that then you can do those things which would please God. God had told the people what His desire was. Now, if God had not told them this, uh, it would be kind of wrong of God to be throwing this up in their face, right? But God had absolutely told the Israelites what was expected of them. He reminded the people over and over that this is exactly what He desired. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, it says, For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. He said, I didn't tell them anything when I brought them out of Egypt about burnt offerings and sacrifices. He said, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Do what now? Obey my voice. Obey my voice. You be my people. Walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. You know what? The sacrifices that they could offer were not the most important part. You know, it's great when we have great worship, and that's a sacrifice. The Bible teaches our worship is a sacrifice. It's great when we, we put on reality houses and we do all the community outreaches that we do. It's a great thing. But at the end of the day, what is God asking from us as people? He talks more in His Word about obedience and our hearts being right than anything else. He talks more about obedience. He talks more about the things that He would have us to do. And listen, I had a preacher say this one time to me. It stuck in my head. I shared this in with my kids. Sit down and ask him. But obedience, success is obedience, period. Man. Success with God is obedience, period. You don't have to ask what being successful in the Christian life is other than to hear what God said right there. Obey my Obey my voice. See, here's the thing. When you get your heart right, everything else will be right. When you get your heart right, you'll be fully devoted to God. When you get your heart right, you'll love those around you, even those who seem unlovable at times. Because here's the truth of the matter this morning. Your heart is a storehouse. Or to put this in modern day terms, your heart is a hard drive. And whatever you burn onto the hard drive of your heart is what will flow out of your life. I guarantee it. Whatever you burn on the hard drive of your heart will flow out of your life. See, you and I shouldn't be surprised when it does. God spends the better part of 14 chapters in the book of Hosea calling attention to the things that are happening among the people of Israel. The sins of the people of Israel. Why is that? Because it was evidence that their heart was not right. 